I wanted to read from 2 Corinthians 8, the first 15 verses. And this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For the willingness is there. The gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be re relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equity. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in the future their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written. The one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. And thus ends the reading of the word of the living God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. God. I'm sure that most of you uh, have heard and know what the word oxymoron means. But in Greek, the word itself means pointed, foolish, pointedly foolish. Uh, oxymoron, when you put two words together, they just really shouldn't be put together to make a whole lot of sense. They contradict each other. Now, some of them would be clearly confused. Act naturally. An open secret. And jumbo shrimp. How can a shrimp be jumbo? What's even better than an oxymoron is when they put together the, made the main statements. The artist Andy Warhol was famous for the statement, I am a deeply superficial person. And Samuel Goodwin, a famous movie producer from the 20th century, was famous for the ones, oxymorons he could put together. And he said things like, give me a smart idiot over a stupid genius any day. And gentlemen, I want you to know that I'm not always right, but I'm never wrong. <laughs> and now one of my favorites, by Dolly Parton, you'd be surprised how much it costs to look this cheap. <laughs> I thought I'd get you somewhere. <coughs> How much it cost to look this cheap? I wonder if Paul really thought about what he was saying in the opening lines in the, this Bible passage. Uh, he wants to tell the believers in the Corinthian church about the incredible spiritual work that God was doing in the Macedonian church. And he says that in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Uh, that doesn't just sound quite right. It, it's, 
may be the mother of all oxymoron. The Macedonian church was undergoing a severe test, severe trial at that time, experiencing overflowing joy, and even though they lived in extreme poverty, they were overflowing with the generosity, rich generosity towards other believers. How often do you hear severe trial and extreme poverty go hand in hand with overflowing joy and rich generosity? It just doesn't sound quite right. But let's make it a little bit easier to make or difficult rather to understand. Let's put it together in a formula and work for just a few minutes. It sounds contradictory, but you've got severe trials plus extreme poverty equals overflowing joy and rich generosity. Amazing. It still doesn't sound quite right, but that's what Paul is saying. What did the people of believers in Macedonia know that the rest of us are missing? If they could say that. Well, the Reverend Gary Whitehead, former rector of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Billings, Montana, uh, tells about a time he was serving a small rural community <laughs> church. Did that get your attention? <laughs> <laughs> well, one Christmas, the church had put together their uh, Christmas baskets with the food and all that they were going to take to some people who they felt like needed them, and they had a lot of food left over. So the preacher decided he would take it that this needy family that lived close to the church but hadn't been on their list. So he makes his way to the church, he drive, uh, from the church to their house, and as he's going over there, he goes, now how am I going to say this and present this to them so that they're not embarrassed and that uh, they don't feel like I'm talking down to them when I present this. So when he got there, He's, he went to the door, he knocked, and the mother came, and he said, do you know anyone who could use some extra food? And she said, well, yes, I do. Let me get my coat. We need to go across town to so-and-so's house. And they got in his car, and they drove across town to somebody else's house. She didn't hesitate to help somebody else in spite of her own needs, her own poverty. She had a gener generous spirit, and she found joy in giving. There's a wonderful story in American history. You may not have heard about it, but in 1847, during the Great Famine in Ireland, the Choctaw Indian tribe uh, raised $147. Now, that would be somewhere between 5000 and 6000 in, in today's money. And they sent it to Ireland. The top trial tribe certainly was not rich, certainly could have used the money itself, but they were generous anyway. They saw others in need and they wanted to reach out and help. Well, fast forward to 2020. In response to the COVID-19 uh, deaths in the Indian nations, the Navajo nation particularly, the Choctaw and the Hobie tribes opened, opened a GoFundMe page to raise money for clean water, medical supplies, and all of that. And donations started pouring in from Ireland. One Irish donor wrote on his you know, GoFundMe page, he said, returning your kindness 170 years and 4,000 miles later. They remembered and they gave out what they had in response. So obviously generosity uh, does not depend on resources. Probably got more to do with matters of the heart. Why do we keep saying that once I have more money, I'll give more? Once I'm in a better financial position, I can do more. Generally, it turns out that that's not true. And I listened from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Paul praises the generosity of the church of Macedonia. He uses their giving as an example to challenge the church in Corinth. And he says, in a gentle way, 
But since you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. That's a tactful way of saying it. For Paul, that's somewhat unusual. But he does it. And he goes on, he says, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Paul's not demanding that they give more. He's just asking them to compare what others are doing and try to do the same or better. He's saying it's a Christian devotion. It's a Christian's obligation to give what they're doing. Giving is a natural expression of our love from God. In Paul's terms, the test of the sincerity of our love to God is found somewhat in our giving. I'm going to offer some reasons this morning that uh, generous giving is critical to the devotional life of a Christian. The first reason concerns the seductive nature of wealth. Now, this is nothing against money. Because money is not all bad. In just a few moments, we're going to be talking all about all the good things that money can do and can accomplish. But there is something very dangerous about money. And it's this. The more you have, the harder it is to share. And I think that's true. A Gallup poll some time back confirmed that what many of us have thought all along. Donations to charities decrease as your income increases. Now they're talking about percentage of income. You may give more dollar-wise, but it's going to be a smaller percentage of what your increase was. And the survey found that low and moderate income Americans give more than upper income Americans. Think about it. The same person who has no difficulty in tithing 10% of $200 salary a week chokes on giving 10% of $2,000. They think, my, that's what I used to be making. I mean, that's what I made a whole, in a whole week back when. But you got to remember that back when, a car only cost $2,000 too. But the more we make, the smaller percentage we give. Of course, that's not true of everyone. I don't mean to imply that it is. <clears throat> Pastor Brian Kluth tells of his friend Don, who was a wealthy businessman who gives to all types of uh, charities and to his church generously. And when Brian asked Don about it one day, he said, uh, it helps me slay the dragon. That's his term. It helps me slay the dragon. And went on to explain that uh, our greatest temptation is to believe that our happiness or our identity comes from buying more, buying newer, better stuff. And he pictures materialism as being a dragon. And every time he writes a check to his church or to a charity, he sees the pen so with the sword slashing against the dragon. Country music star Ricky Skaggs and his wife believe in tithing, giving 10% of their income to the church or to charities. And he says, and I quote, I believe, if I believe anything about the Bible, I have to know that God wants my money because he knows my money wants me. God doesn't need my money, but he wants whatever I want more than him. Now think about it. God doesn't need our money. But he wants whatever we want more than him. If there's something standing in our way of coming to God, coming to Jesus, God wants it out of the way. He wants us to slay the dragon by giving generously. And we can, if we do that, we can get rid of pride, greed, self-centeredness, 
everything that stands between us and the kingdom of God. Everything that stands between us and happiness and our identity in God. John Wesley used, used a full criteria for, for any purchase he made. And uh, they're rather strict uh, questions. Am I acting as a steward of the Lord's goods? Is this, just, is this a good use of my money? Am I making this purchase in obedience to the word of God? Would God object to this for any reason? Can I offer up this expense as a sacrifice to God through Jesus Christ? And do I have reason to believe that this purchase will bring me a reward at the resurrection of the just? Those are tough questions. Now, how many of us are sitting here thinking about the credit card bills that we have. The dragon of materialism is getting larger and larger in our society today and our society's value system. It's not easy in our day and time to live by God's value system. It should work the other way around, though. It should get easier to give as our wealth increases, but it doesn't seem that way. There's some attraction to money. That's just its nature. Jesus knew that. That's why he talked about money more than any other topic. And he said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You see, giving is a spiritual question. And for some of us, our souls may depend on it. The second reason Generous giving is critical to the devotional life of a Christian. It has to do with the wonderful things that money can do and that money can buy. Now, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm going to let you know I like money. And I think all of us do, and we should. Nothing wrong with that. Regardless of our circumstances, I think we'll have to admit that there are some things only money can buy like braces for our children's teeth, a good education, quality health care, worry-free retirement, dependable transportation, a warm house or home on a cold winter night. In a society such as ours, money is a valuable commodity to have. The British pastor C. H. Spurgeon was one of the most famous uh, and influential preachers of the late 1800s, early 1900s. In addition to his church ministry, he had uh, established and founded an orphanage in London. And he would preach a special service each year just for this orphanage to raise money for it. And one year at this special service, a man came up to him and said in sort of an accusing way, he said, well, Mr. Spurgeon, I thought you preached for souls and not for money. And Spurgeon answered, normally I do preach for souls and not for money, but my orphans can't eat souls, and if they did, my brother, it would take at least four of yous to feed them and give them one square meal. <laughs> Our giving is a spiritual matter, simply because there are some things in this world only money can do. Money can help build houses for the homeless. Money can help feed the hungry. Money can help send Bibles overseas to new Christians in developing countries. It can provide counselors for young people in runaway shelters. And it can build a beautiful church, a workplace of worship, so that secular people would come and learn about God and hear about it. My guess would be that most of us, probably not all, but most of us would have enough money in our wallet right now to feed a hungry child for two or three days. I wish that child could feed and live off of our prayers and good wishes. But it ain't going to happen. Not without money. 
giving it's a spiritual matter. First of all, because of the seductive nature of wealth. You get it and it's harder to share. And because of some of the wonderful things that only money can do. And finally, it's a spiritual matter because when you stop and think about it, we worship a giving God. We worship a giving God. Paul follows the two verses that we've already talked about and read about with these words. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich.